giving you a little lecture. Um, all right. So I don't think I need to repeat that on the lecture for today. Okay, then there is a, here is last time. Uh, last time we finished up on Locke, on Galileo, Bacon, and Locke. It was an hour and a half on that. And we did an hour and a half on Kant. Today we do an hour and a half on Kant and we do an hour and a half on utilitarianism. Um, let me give you one example of a student whose post, um, I think that I've had one student post so far or something, not very many. So um, I don't know why, and I have office hours. Uh, I put it in the chat. The office hours are after class today, nine hours from now, nine hours from the end of class, and 23 hours from the end of class. And I said, I want you to have two posts done before the next class. So you just have to do it, that's all. <laughs> One step at a time. So the post about this, the every post has to start out with three things that you came to class wanting to comment on showing me in your post that you read the assignment before class, okay? Then you have three things during class that struck you, that you learned from the other students or that you learned from the lecture. I would prefer that you learned in your discussion groups because I want to know that those groups are going okay. That, excuse me, then, after you've looked over, after you've read the material, you've sat through the class, then you have your final reflection on that topic, that class. And that should relate to your final paper, My Environmental Ethic. So you, you read Bacon, Kant, and I mean, Bacon, Galileo, and Locke, for example. So this is what one student wrote in her post in her reflections. And, and I would hope you would understand why I want each of you to have your own posts because you are teaching yourself, not only about environmental ethics in general, you're teaching yourself about what's going on in your country and you're teaching yourself about colonialism and you're teaching yourself about things that are going on that are really important. They're going to affect your life. They're already affecting your life. Okay, so I'm not gonna say the name of the student, but I have to say the country that the student comes from because she talks about it a lot. So her final reflection, right, is first of all, she noticed Locke's view of individual freedom. And um, that in Cambodia, she says, the government controls speech. So, um, and punishes dissonance, right? People who disagree with the government get punished. So she does value freedom. And she does value the fact that in the USA, we have free speech, okay. Then she noticed that Adam Smith said, it's really important to raise your children to be generous, not to be greedy. That is really important. And the importance of that is gonna play out every single day in this class. So the person who first uh, structured a free market in a free market economy, that's Adam Smith said, but you must train your citizens not to be greedy and to be generous. And this is not what has happened historically. And it's very, very important. Then she talked about Bacon's idols. Remember, idols of the cave, idols of the tribe, idols of the marketplace, idols of the theater, all the ways that we get our thoughts are distorted and we uh, think we know the truth and we don't, we're just ignorant. So she said, 
the ideas of the marketplace, she said today that amounts to social media. Yes, I agree. So many of these things that you're reading about, Bacon has his own example. That's when people literally get their bodies to the marketplace. But today we go on to social media, but it's the same issue of whoever you happen to bump into controls your thoughts or affects your thoughts without asking, are they qualified to say that? Do they know what they're talking about? Okay, so that's important. Another thing, she said that Locke wanted a barter system so that people could not hoard their goods or hoard money. People just trade. So she said that would be better today in Cambodia because now everybody just chases money, right? And their goal is more and more money and more and more power. Um, she talked about colonialism in Cambodia, where the French came in and exploited the forests and the minerals and taxed poor people. Now, she sees it as China coming in and exploiting, right? China has taken over the biggest port in Cambodia. And she also thought that it was absolutely crazy that people in the U.S., um, refuse to wear masks, okay? And they also refuse to get the vaccine. But that goes back to that individual rights, okay? We're gonna talk about this because it's very important. Um, let's see. So, all right. So she said she's fascinated with um, the problem of Western colonialism and especially today, this is true, and I and the AUW students are in a very unique and important position relation in relation to this issue. Is that today education is the ticket to a better life, and because if you get a higher education, you can get be qualified for one of the better jobs. The trouble is, you have to be wealthy to get a decent education. And then your children will interview for a job and they'll actually be more qualified. And so you don't have to, you know, bribe the people hiring. The people hiring don't have to be corrupt because the system's set up so that the children of the rich get the better jobs and they stay rich, you get richer. So that's a huge problem. And the people who started AUW knew it was a huge problem and they started it partly for that reason. So the centralization of wealth is a constant problem and technology has generally made that worse rather than better because of education. All right, so that's an example of one student reacting to the material. Now, I want each of you to react to it in your own way relative to your context. I want to do that for two reasons. I want you to be learning about your country and also about the effect of all these ideas on your country right now. And I want to learn about what's going on in your countries, right? This is my way of getting educated also. All right, so that was, that was uh, Locke. Now there are two videos on the YouTube, remember. One of them is called Bacon and Galileo. It's 25, 30 minutes. One of them is called Locke. It's, I think, 30 minutes. Okay, you got to do both. It says class number two. All right. So there it is. There's the YouTube channel. And there is a post called Video on Posts and on the Grading System. Okay. Now, last time, we spent the last half hour talking about Kant. All right. Why is Kant important? Kant is called dualist. He's a dualistic thinker. Why? Because he thinks that, all right, let me take it, do this. All right. So each of these points of view, Galileo, Bacon, Locke, Kant, utilitarianism, and Karl Marx. 
The first section of this class is about modern science, industry, technology, this huge emergence, right? This huge leap forward in science and the application of science for human physical well being. So the material conditions of our lives improve immensely. All right. And it, and so, and it was a product of science. So we have Newtonian physics. Science meant more than one thing Newtonian physics and then empirical science, data collecting. All right. So Kant was, he taught Newtonian physics and he insisted that Newton's system was a system of scientific laws that was internally consistent, logically consistent. The principles of science, like the law of gravity, the law of attraction, um, something in motion will stay in motion unless friction is, is applied to it. All those laws are absolutely true, objectively true, necessarily true. They show causal, causal connections, the notion of causality. Um, and, but David Hume said, you don't know that. He said, the laws are about things like physical things, right? Physical things are not laws. Physical things are not necessarily true. We don't, from our observations, we cannot conclude that everything is logically connected. From our observations, we cannot conclude that this is universal. It's not necessary. The pen didn't necessarily exist and it's not gonna last. It's not, I mean, none of those characteristics that Kant is uh, saying science has are characteristics of the things science is about. So science is supposedly universal, objective, necessary, blah, blah. But science is about material things and material things aren't like that. So Kant's conclusion is that our minds filter, filter in the data. Like we have reason, we have these construction in our head. And, the, and our experience of the world is just our, our minds control what we experience. So that if there's something out there that doesn't fit in to the body of scientific laws, we don't experience it, okay? So what he calls, what we experience, he calls the phenomena. So what I encounter is phenomena. And there, there, is, there is every reason to think there's something else out there, but we don't know what it is. Our senses don't take it in because we can't fit it with a, the body of scientific laws. So he splits reality into two pieces, the phenomena, which is our experience, and then the noumena, which is the thing itself, okay? So now we can say, we don't have necessary knowledge of all of reality, we just have necessary knowledge of the phenomena. So he's using an analogy. Aristotle thought that the universe evolved, human beings evolved, they reacted to the universe. As they reacted, their brains developed according to those reactions. As our, uh, our lives became more complex, we started to see more patterns out there in the world and our brains developed in order to further explain those patterns. And the more our brains developed to explain them, the more we succeeded at adapting to the world. So for Aristotle, there's a direct correspondence between the outside world and our brains because our brains developed in relationship to that. 
They're reacting to it. Kant understands that he is completely turning things around. He's saying everything starts here and we filter experience through our heads. Okay, that's important. It has an important implication for environmental ethics and our relation to the natural environment. So it might seem like just something philosophers talk about, but it's not just idle talk. It's a whole way of reacting to the world. Um, so scientific laws are universal, necessary, internally consistent, objective, cause effect, logical, but they're all constructed by human reason in relation to the way we experience it. What's the relation between reason and faith? Why is there anything? These are, these are questions that reason cannot answer because on Kant's view of reason, this is not Locke's view. This is not Bacon's view. This is not, okay, this is Kant's view of reason cannot answer why is there anything? What do the laws of, of reason apply to? What don't they apply to? What else is out there? What's the relation between what we experience and what's out there? What is the noumena? Does the human soul exist? We don't know because our reason only takes in phenomena and the human soul is not a phenomena. Is it immortal? Does free will exist? Those are all questions that have to be um, determined indirectly. We can't know it. It's just more reasonable to think or to believe certain things, okay? It's more reasonable to conclude that there is a God that created the universe. Um, and it's more reasonable to think that there's a soul, freedom, and immortality. And I'll explain that in just a minute. Okay, that's the next outline. Why is it reasonable to think there's a soul? Um, all right, this is usually when I have 50 minute classes. So I start out summarizing the previous class, but I think in your case, rereading this is probably good. All right, now he wants to argue that if everything else in the world has just the phenomena and something else, then human beings have, it's reasonable to think that we can understand ourselves as phenomena, but also that we can under, understand ourselves as noumena, as over and beyond phenomena? Why? If all we are is a phenomena, which is our physical body, our physical bodies function according to necessary laws, like gravity. I cannot, my body cannot defy gravity. But everything in the, the world of science is determined by those laws. So if human beings are only the phenomenal self, then all of their behavior is determined and they have no moral responsibility and no free will, right? So they're just these, you know, cranked up robotic kind of creatures roaming around and they can't help anything they do. They don't have choice. Everything occurs with the same kind of necessity that this pen dropping because of gravity occurs, okay? Now, he says it's more reasonable to think that there's more to the human humanity than that. Since we know, we already know, there's more to the rest of the world than just what we see. Okay, so that's one reason to think there's more to us, but there's another reason. And that is the way that we are conscious of ourselves, okay? Our internal consciousness. We are conscious that we have bodies, right? We are conscious that we get motivated 
by emotions that are connected to our bodies, obviously. I'm hungry, I wanna eat, I go eat, right? That's a behavior completely motivated by our physical selves, our self as a kind of animal, a kind of phenomenon, pleasure and pain. That's what Kant calls inclinations. Or somebody makes you angry, and so you go yell at them. Well, that's triggered by some other phenomena. It triggers an emotion, and you go and yell at them, right? Um, but we're also conscious of ourselves. As somebody will tell us, you ought not to yell at that person. And you can tell yourself, I, I ought not to yell at them. I want to yell at them, but I ought not to, okay? Every human being has that consciousness. So we are conscious of being able to, to act in more than one way, right? Well, the source of that is our reason, right? So we can conceive of ourselves as giving ourselves moral laws, just like the scientific world functions according to scientific law, reason, the creatures with reason are conscious that they can use their reason to tell themselves how to behave. So in our minds, we can understand that we can live according to what our reason tells us or according to how we feel, right? Well, if we have choices like that, that means we have a will, a free will, because that's the capacity that enables us to actually choose to live by reason, right? I mean, if you had reason telling you you ought not to do that, inclination telling you, but you had no free will, it wouldn't matter what your reason said because your inclinations would do whatever they wanted. So we must have this power of reason um, to actually choose. Well, um, if we have a free will, then um, it's the free will is not a phenomenon, right? So it must be a noumenal. It must be part of our noumenal self. So it's possible for us to think both that we are free and that we're not free. So our bodies are not free, but our souls are free. Okay, that's the most reasonable way to think. So reason keeps tell, tells us to think that we have a noumenal self and we have this power of free will. Um, all right, then in every case, a good will. So when we decide we have this power to choose, a good will always asks, what does reason want me to do? And what does reason? Reason formulates bodies of laws. So reason will formulate a moral law that you should follow. So either you follow your emotions or you follow the moral law, okay? Um, a good will is, a good will, right, is the one that always chooses to follow the moral law. A good will is more important than intelligence or wealth or anything else a person can gift, right? Good looks or whatever, because any of those other gifts can be used for good uh, for evil, right? Inclinations. You can take these purely physical, emotional drives and attach your intelligence to that to get rich or any other gift that you have. The only thing that is truly good is this desire to follow the moral law. So the goodwill shines through. All right, next step. And again, if you want to stop the video for a minute, digest it, because each step here is important. So that's the first, that's the next step, right? A good will is the ultimate good. 
Every time I act, I have to ask, what does reason require? And then I do it. That gives me ultimate worth. Um, and when I'm asking what follows the moral law, I should not consider the consequences. It's the principle of the thing, right? And the principles involved are, let's see, all right. Well, first of all, the moral laws are not necessarily true or objectively true because we always have a choice. So, um, okay, so they're, they have a different nature. The moral laws are categorical imperatives. They're not absolutes. They're because they won't necessarily happen. But the way you frame it to your will is that you should absolutely do this. There are no exceptions. You can't say, but my mother or but this. No, it's absolutely right to do this. It's absolutely wrong to do that. The thing is, people still won't necessarily do it. So moral laws are not necessarily going to be obeyed the way that scientific laws are. Um, okay. Now, okay. The next step is every time you make a decision, you have to act. There's always two principles that you have to follow. One of them is Never act otherwise than that you can will that you're, um, that the maxim, okay. What it means is what should everybody do in this case, right? What's, what's the universal moral law for everybody, not just me? And you can ask yourself lots of times when you're making decisions, someone will say, well, what if everybody did that, right? So this is, you know, taking common sense and saying, actually, that's a dictate of reason. You have to take that really seriously. Everything you decide, you have to, you have to will that everyone do it. Um, even though you know they won't, as a matter of fact, you might not do it, but you have to think in principle, this is what everyone should do. That's his, his he uses fancy language. But what he means is, in principle, if you find the moral law you think applies, in principle, you think everyone should do that. And a goodwill is the most perfect thing in the universe. It gives us dignity, right? So when we act out of pleasure and pain and inclination, that's an undignified way to act. That's the way animals act. But if you act according to a good will, according to reason, that's what gives you infinite, that's your dignity. Your reason gives you infinite worth and you're, you get your dignity from choosing according to reason. The other moral law you should always impose upon yourself, no exceptions, is always treat humanity either yourself or anyone else, never as a means only, okay? So you can, and I mean, I'm sure you've had discussions and said, you're using another person, right? Using another person. Is this being recorded? Yes. Dr. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thanks. I don't have the little... <laughs> It doesn't show me on the, on the screen share. Um, okay, so you say you shouldn't use another person. That's the common sense expression for what he says. Oh, it's true that I have to use people in many contexts in my life. When I go to the grocery store, the cash cashier, I use her, right, to check me out so I can have my food. But don't treat her just as a means. Don't treat her just as a tool for your inclinations. 
treat her as an end in herself, right? Treat her as a rational being. Okay, so I let me give you an example today. I was at the cashier buying my food and she said, do you have Amazon Prime? Because I guess you get a discount at this particular store and I moved, so I have no idea what's going on in Minnesota. Uh, and I said, well, yeah, I do, but how, how on earth could you know that? <laughs> And she said, well, do you have some app? And I'm like, no, I don't have an app, sorry. And so she just kind of looked at me and she said, I think I believe you. And I said, do I look like somebody who, who oh, I said, I got it because I order a lot of books. And she looked at me and I said, do I look like somebody that reads a lot of books? And she said, and I said, I am a philosophy teacher. And she said, oh, I'm a philosophy major. I love philosophy. So we got in this big conversation about philosophy, metaphysics and ontology. Wow. Um, and then I told her, well, you're going to starve to death if you go to try to go to grad school and that. And she said, no, no, I'm also studying elementary education. So she's going to be an elementary education teacher who was a philosophy major who loved metaphysics. So that's great. Anyway, I did not treat her as a means only. I treated her as an end in herself. And it turned out we had a whole lot in common because we value reason of all things. Um, all right. So, okay, here's another thing. Your reason gives yourself the moral law and your reason demands that good people are happy and rewarded and bad people are unhappy and punished. That's just reasonable, okay? Reason sort of demands that. Reason demands justice. But because of inclinations and because of the material part of our lives, that does not always happen right? Good people suffer unjustly, bad people are rewarded unjustly. All these things happen, but given our reason, given our free, free will, or we, we should believe we have free will, it's reasonable to believe that there is an eternal life where the good are rewarded and the, and the evil are punished, because that satisfies our reason. Okay, um, let's see. So it's more reasonable to believe in eternal justice. So then our reason tells us we should not act on inclinations. We should act on the moral law. And it's reasonable to think there will ultimately be reward and punishment. Um, so let me just give you an example of a conflict of duties, all right? So when your reason tells you the moral law is you ought to do this, sometimes there's, there's two moral laws. And I'll give you an example. I had an uncle who was Danish. He lived in Denmark during World War II and he was a Baptist minister and he was a major player in the underground, which was getting the Jews out of Germany and out of Europe up to Sweden and um, Norway so that they could escape the Holocaust. So he was actually knighted by the Queen of England and all sorts of stuff. But when his children were young, when he was doing this, he hid them in his attic of his church. So the Gestapo would come to the door and they would say, are you hiding Jews? All right. Now, on the one hand, your reason tells you you should never tell a lie. I talked about that last time. Language is, the, is a system of universals. Language is created by reason. You should never use language to deliberately say something that your reason knows is false. Like that's a contradiction. That's reason contradicting itself, right? So you should never, it's never rational to tell a lie. On the other hand, 
you have the Gestapo treating Jews as means only, not as ends, okay? So you have a conflict of duties. You want to treat Jewish people as ends in themselves, not means, and you want to prevent the Gestapo from, choose, from treating them as means. But you also don't want to lie. Well, in that case, saving Jews is more important than not telling a lie. So of course he lied. He said he did not, uh, he was not hiding Jews. So that's an example of a conflict of duties. So um, anyway, it's Kant understands it's more complex than just one absolute clear, they never conflict. You can create this huge system of laws Nobody's going to ever uh, doubt what law applies. It's more complicated than that. But ultimately, Kant thought you could develop this whole system where any sort of conflict of duties could be prioritized. And you could teach yourself, just like you learn science, you could teach yourself how to behave according to a goodwill, according to the moral law. So this is what Kant thought. By distinguishing between phenomena and noumena, he's preserved the validity of necessary scientific laws. He's established the reasonableness of belief in God. He's preserved the belief of free will in the face of scientific method that might deny it, right? He's preserved the belief in immortality uh, and the belief in divine reward and punishment. All of his positions are based on our own experience of our consciousness. And he's limited the scope of reason to make room for a new understanding. So this is a new view of what it means to believe in God, freedom, and immortality. So now he's got this view, but it's consistent with modern science, modern physics. Um, all right. Now, let me just keep going because I, the question should need to focus on his view of animal rights, right? We want to get to his view of the environment. Um, his method of teaching ethics to little kids is that you teach them from a young age to respect their reason. Reason is holy and sacred to follow your duty. So, you know, the little kid comes in, Johnny hit me, I wanna hit him back. Nope, you just sit the parent down. I mean, the parent sits the kids down and says, look, you have reason. You don't have to hit him back. You have, your, you have your free will. It's your greatest treasure. It's something you should value more than anything, that you have the power not to hit back. And that should make you really happy. And you should, right? That should be your ultimate value. Your ultimate pleasure is that you don't have to hit him back. You can act on the basis of reason. Um, and so just do that over and over until the kid gets used to that, till that's the first thing that comes to them. So they don't react <laughs> emotionally. <laughs> I'm thinking, I was just at my grandson's soccer game and I, yeah, okay, it's a bit of a stretch, but maybe <laughs> if you train them carefully enough, um, you make people conscious of their freedom. Of course, the kid has to get older, right? every age, they would be more capable of thinking about their dignity, their freedom, their the amazing fact that they don't have to react to what's outside of them at all. They can have this habit of, ju of judging actions according to the moral law, sharpening their judgments, having practice, you know, practicing, um, make sure you do it out of respect for the moral law. It's not that, gee, if I don't hit Johnny back, 
the teacher will give me, you know, an extra candy bar or something. No, that's an ulterior motive. You do it just because it's the right thing to do. Um, you take satisfaction in that. Your parents honor you for that. Your parents model that sort of stuff. Um, and the value of it, you just more and more can see the value of what you're doing. Become conscious of your freedom. Freedom is a, a power that you have apart from any circumstances at all. Um, you develop reverence for your own freedom and then the moral law, right? So you know that if everybody hit back, we just have chaos. But if everybody reacted uh, according to this, um, this reverence for free will and a good will, we'd have this wonderful world. And so you just keep, keep playing on that, keep envisioning this totally different world from the one around you, but you still have the freedom to choose that. Um, okay. Moral character is based on concepts and principles, not emotions and moods, right? Just get your kid, you know, focused. What is the right thing to do? What ought you to do? Not trying to be a hero. <laughs> um, all right. And then I talked about making those decisions, whether or not to commit suicide. Well, rational creatures, uh, our value, have ultimate worth. Um, rational creatures by, you know, they love themselves. They understand what value the power of reason is and the power of free will. So nothing that loves itself will kill itself. All rational creatures love life, especially rational life. Um, so they won't kill themselves. It's a contradiction. You can't recognize the ultimate worth of reason know that you're a creature that has that power and that capacity and then kill yourself. You can't do that. The only cause would be inclination. So it's anti-rational and it's wrong, right? It's a contradiction. Uh, whether or not to tell a lie. Language is a set of universals. It's created by reason. It satisfies reason. It's the way we communicate with another person's mind. So to take that tool of reason and because of inclination to, to pervert it and tell a lie, the only reason you would is because of inclination. So that's a contradiction. It contradicts your reason and reason will never agree to tell a lie. And then no false promise. Reason will never agree to false promises because they're kind of lies. Um, no rational creature abuses language at all. Um, every rational creature wills to cultivate their talents as a rational creature. The only reason they would not would be inclination or pleasure and that contradicts reason. Reason will always require that you develop yourself as a, as a rational creature. Whether to be generous, uh, rational creatures know that they depend on other rational creatures to flourish and they have basic needs. And so you can't will it to be a universal law that somebody has extra money or goods and they don't share them, right? Everybody should be treated as an end and generosity, if you have the resources, is treating everybody as an end, as equally rational by nature and equally deserving of the material goods they need to prosper, okay? Um, so he's, he's using a kind of mathematical formula for ethics. He's starting out with these definitions or these insights about what it means to be rational. So in his head, 
it's this a priori reasoning, this capacity to create this body of laws and explain the phenomena, what we think of as the outside world, which is really our experience of it, and then create a set of moral laws to, motive, to govern our will. So we have a free will. We have every reason to think we have it. We make laws. We should follow those laws, not inclination. And we should respect each other as of infinite worth for that reason. All right. So that's his model of reason. Now, why is that important for environmental ethics? because nothing else in the universe has infinite worth. Only human beings. They are absolutely infinitely more valuable than anything else in the, in the natural world and anything else in the whole universe, okay? Kant has this little paragraph where he's musing about the whole universe. And he says, you know, if you look at how big it is, it seems like we're nothing. But if you look at our consciousness and you realize that we are of infinite worth, we're way more, we're of more worth than anything else in the whole universe because our, un our reason is so amazing. All right. Okay, well, where does that put animals and plants and, you know, ecosystems and all that stuff, right? So his claim is that humanity is an end in itself um, because we act in accordance with our concept of laws. Um, we don't act like animals to maximize pleasure. Our rationality has absolute worth. Um, we should always treat humanity as an end in itself. Then when it comes to animals, they don't have that faculty. They don't, have, excuse me, have a will. They don't have the capacity to act on the basis of a moral law with no other motive. Animals always act on inclinations. They always act on the basis of what they see or smell or hear. So we do not have direct duties to treat animals as ends. Animals are not ends in themselves. So, and we don't have any duty to treat them that way. We ought to act in humane ways toward them because when we act in inhumane ways, we damage our own humanity and we're more likely to mistreat other human beings. That's the reason. So treating animals decently is a means to the end of treating human beings as ends, okay? If a man shoots his dog, because the animal is no longer capable of service. He does not fail in his duty to the dog, okay? We don't owe the dog anything, but he's acting in an inhumane way and he damages his humanity, which is, um, which is the duty, he, he does have a duty to be humane toward human beings. So, he shouldn't stifle his human feelings. So he has to practice kindness towards animals as a means to the end, which is treating human beings as ends. All right. Um, so it's okay to do animal experiments that harm animals if they promote human well being, like cancer research. Alzheimer's research, whatever. But just killing animals for sport is not justified because it's being inhumane and it would more likely make you willing to kill human beings or to mistreat them in some 
way. Um, okay, so that's that's it. Um, all right, and here's a little excerpt where Kant explains himself. So I would like you to read it. I guess it's not easy to read, but it's a really short excerpt, right? It's about one page. Um, and just to give you some sense of how he wrote, how he understood things. Um, let's see. Now, what I would like you to do is you, you should have come to class today with three points already before class, right? Then um, if you did, then when we go into breakout groups, you can use those if you want to. If you didn't, you should have made some points while I was talking that stuck out in your mind, right? So think about the impact of this view on the way we treat the environment, the way we treat the natural world. It's perfectly fine for us to engage in farming, of course, and you know, factory farming, whatever, as long as it's not too inhumane, right? So would Kant think factory farming is inhumane? Well, we don't necessarily mow down the animals, right? We just put them in these big cages. So I, my inclination would be to think that as long as we aren't literally, you know, uh, breaking their necks off or something where we're physically brutalizing, you know, killing them with our hands, uh, he, I don't, I'm not convinced he would think that that was wrong, right? Because the way we do factory farms doesn't necessarily make people less humane toward other people because it really just amounts to using animals as a means to human nourishment. That's pretty much what factory farms are. Uh, shooting animals for sport, for fun, is you know taking pleasure in shooting animals. Now, if it is to um, cut down on too many deer, like if you didn't shoot the deer, they would end up dying because they'd eat too many um, of the shoots of the um, tree shoots so that trees would um, not grow. So there is that, but I still think Kant, he does not like the idea of going out and shooting animals for sport. Uh, but running factory farms for meat, I think he would think that was probably okay. Um, so that's number one. Is it, do you think animals have any rights or dignity? Or do you think it's important to treat them as anything other than a means to an end? So you can talk about that in your groups. Um, and then the next point do you think that everybody would be better off and the environment would be better off if everybody ignored all their inclinations and emotions and just acted on a good will, right? And the number one uh, principle is to treat other humans as ends in themselves. Well, What's going to happen if we run out of food or water, uh, right? Or if we pollute the air? How are we going to um, deal with that on Kant's view, right? Okay, well, we can't treat other people as means. We have to treat them as ends. So everyone should get clean air, clean water. But what happens if that means that you have to um, tell poor people they can't cut down trees to have fire to cook their food, right? So how are you going to, you know, 
Where's the goodwill in all of that? And then one last point is that Kant is the beginning of this huge drive toward skyscrapers, engineering, okay? Just engineers think like Kant and they use math to create, you know, skyscrapers and all bridges and all this stuff. And then after that, it was artificial intelligence, computers. So the history behind the kind of intellectual training that Kant emphasized a priori reasoning apart from experience and apart from ourselves as animals, um, that the origin of it was connected to the belief that we can exploit nature indefinitely for human well being. In order to treat humans as ends, we can treat the rest of the natural world as a means. Okay, that's the foundation for all of that intellectual explosion, that branch of it. Now, I'm, I was just reading, I just started the book by Bill Gates um, about how to avoid a climate disaster. So Gates is the same age as I am, maybe a year different. And I knew about climate change starting in 1968. And I grew up in a pretty provincial place. I didn't grow up on the coast, you know, California, New York, any of those places that really people are ahead of the curve. I grew up in like the Midwest, you know, <laughs> flyover country. But I knew about climate change. And a lot of people knew before that, right? So Al Gore knew by 1960. People knew this stuff. You didn't have to be that smart. You didn't have to be that plugged in. But Bill Gates did not. And I kept wondering, why isn't he doing anything about this? And I actually thought, he thought the free market would decide that somebody would invent some product and the price would get so good that people would prefer electric cars. He did not think that oil and gas billionaires would control all the political elections and tell the legislators to make laws that would continue to make fossil fuel vehicles less expensive. And we're still doing that in our country. But Bill Gates, the engineer, didn't see it, right? He didn't see that it was a problem and he didn't see that wicked people would make that problem worse. And so the market by itself, the free market would not respond. Now, I just read a book by him and he said that it wasn't until 2006 that he was convinced that this was a problem, which is just amazing for somebody that smart not to know that. And he actually defines himself as an engineer. He says, I'm an engineer. I don't get politics. I don't know what's going on in politics. But here, I finally get climate change. But he should have gotten it in 1966. Like he's, what, 50 years behind the times? 40 years? Whatever. But that's because the root of that particular branch of education, that use of your brain was not connected to nature. And it has had this dualistic separation of reason from nature has had this tremendous impact for decades. So all over, well, in the US, and then we export this education to the rest of the world. So all over the world, there can be highly trained engineers that are either ignorant about climate change or they're in denial about climate change or the only jobs they can get um, make it worse. Like all those engineering jobs, helping fossil fuel companies 
dig deeper into the earth to get, you know, more oil or more gas or fracking or all those other wonderful engineering technological wizardry um, syst uh, means of continuing to have a fossil fuel carbon um, carbon negative economy. So that's those are reasons that I think you need to study Kant and you need to think about it. And you need to think about that way of thinking and whether or not you agree, maybe you do agree, but whatever, you need to know the origin of it and you need to know it still is impacting people. Um, uh, Charles Koch, had a, has a PhD from, I mean, not a PhD, a BA from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the number one math, science, STEM, engineering school in the US. He has a bachelor's. He is probably the number one fossil fuel, fossil fuel forever guy that's controlling our political system to make sure fossil fuels are forever because that's how he increases his wealth. And he is, I don't know, in the top 15 for wealth. He's obsessed about it and he can use his engineering expertise to perpetuate it. And that's what he's doing. So you have the fossil fuel engineers versus the green engineers and they're billionaires, right? And they're both fighting it out. And I don't think Kant's philosophy can really tell us which one's right because he, Kant never considered the possibility of having to curb your rational capacities um, and having to have respect for the natural world. So, um, I am going to break you into groups now, and you must assign someone to be the leader or someone has to volunteer. And that person has to call on people. And if you want to pass, you pass, but you sh there should be something that you would want to say. I can't believe there's nothing, but I'm not going to police you. I don't like entering those rooms. I tried it once and I caught a girl complaining, right? I'm confused. And, you know, I'm just telling you, please don't do that. It says the fourth class, we're far along, be proactive, get it together, and have you can have something to say. Listen to the other students, um, and keep the conversation going and keep focused on the material. So um, I will put you in breakout rooms and I will let you go for 15 minutes. If that's too long, the leader should come in and say, I think we've run out of things to say and we will move on. The goal is three, th three hours minus a five minute break of staying on task. All right.
think that I should make groups bigger. Four. Okay. It's four and this is three. No colors. One. This one. This one and move to room two. Hello, Professor. Hello. I do not like all of them left. Oh, actually, I just put you in a different room so that the rooms will be bigger. Does that make sense? Okay, so do so. Hello, professor. Yes, yes. Professor, I'm very sorry to leave because no one was talking and I was like asking about the things and they were like, no, we, we, were, we will not discuss, like we don't know. And I, I'm just very, <laughs> I don't Trust know what it. to talk with them. Yeah, it's like from the last class. Okay, um, just I'm gonna write the names down here. Um, of okay, all right, yeah, that's it's sad because I don't know what else I'm supposed to do. Um, right, does this happen in other classes? I don't know, professor, but I think you should you should go and check for one class. Right. So, one which, group, which group is that? It was group two, I guess, the last time. Yeah, okay, let's see. Um, all right, let me see which group it is this time. Um, let's see, three C. Okay.
Hi, Stressy. Hello. Are you in any breakout room? No, actually I was, but no one was talking and it was so frustrating. Um, that's so why I have a breakout room. Um, do you want to talk with me about animal? Oh, can you do an animal right? Yes, uh, I cannot hear you. What about? Oh, I was just asking, do you want to share with me what? Yeah, like, yeah sure. What if, you, if you have a point of view, you can share first. Okay, um, so relating to Kent's view on animal rights, um, Kent believes that people shouldn't have a motive to treat animals cruelly so they don't become brutal and direct that brutality to other human beings. I don't think that human brutal cruelty on one another is a reflection from their behaviors and animals because I feel like an animal lover can also harm another human being. So I think it is more about how humans interact and control their anger because a lot of the arguments that end up in fights exist because humans can't calmly communicate with one another. And it is a human instinct to always want to win. So their egos can let another human being like be better than them. And an example I brought up is that a farmer who goes out to hunt birds to really stress that can't define him as a person like who he is, whether he's cruel or not, you know, he might use a gun to shoot birds, but at home, he may be the kind, kindest person in his community. So I feel like his action of killing birds to really stress can't reflect his inner soul and a cruel and deadly person exists, not because of their motive to treat animals brutally, but because they don't know how to control themselves. Uh, so I think you uh, like you were saying about like kill, killing anim animals or something like we have to think about the motive first, like why is the person is killing the animal? Like, um, is this because of I think it's um, I actually have some mixed impressions about that. It's like if a, if a person wants to kill an animal as like can say that this is brutal and something, but let's not say that directly. But sometimes, yeah, it's brutal if people start killing animals like without any uh, like without any thoughts or without any motives, they just enjoy themselves doing that. I like I guess there is there are people who do enjoy killing animals and innocent animals, but um, in some cases they are, yeah, there is motive like some people goes for hunting, uh, some people kill animals for their jobs like people, uh, professor has mentioned earlier in earlier class like the butchers maybe uh, they kill animals like because it's a part of their job and also for the people who buy the meat and another thing is that um another thing is that it but it could be dangerous like if this exists killing um what, what, what was that what was the rule no this is the main rule uh, you can continue i don't think it matters oh uh, yeah yeah the brutality yeah so this um uh, I think everyone's returning to this can yeah, be yeah. this can be really dangerous and i i mm -hmm. heard once like there in in recent years there was a festival in some country people were killing uh, if people were enjoying like killing the whales whales uh, oh. from the sea yeah there is a festival in some country i forgot and this was really brutal like I guess that's that's how this rule applies. So do you want to share when everyone's back together? Because you didn't get a chance to fully share. I, I don't know if, if, uh, if I got a chance, okay? No, it's okay. Um, if you want to, you can share that. Okay, sure. Uh, also, I guess we both can share too, like, you also have a different point of view. 
So yeah, I searched about the country. It was like Denmark who oh, does okay. this festival. Okay, let's see. Oh, okay. So now I'm recording when I hadn't planned to be recording, but that's all right. I think most people are back. Um, so I I look forward to meeting with you in office hours. If uh, you need help, just start, okay, at the bottom of the screen. Does everybody understand what you're supposed to do? I hope, right? Just, I don't, I guess I don't understand why this would be different from any other class that you start at the beginning you Professor. Right, yeah. Oh, I think it will be uh, really good for me like if you describe our second assignment uh, for me. I'm confused with that, but if you told me to come your office hour, it's okay, I will come. No, the assignment. Okay, so if you go on to the YouTube channel, right? It has a 25 minute explanation of the assignments. So here's the environmental ethic. So um, that's class number one. And here's class number two. Here's the video about the posts and the grading. Here's class number two again. Here's class number three. Okay, does that make sense? And then I will, I will do, oops, I will do class number four. Um, whoops, 
<laughs> okay. Let me oh my God. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Now, does that make sense? That's what I'd like you to do. Okay, so we need to watch the video and submit our opinion on Google Classroom. You submit what I, what I, you call what I call a post, right? Yeah. Okay. And so the half hour video explains the post. Okay. All right, so I'm just going to have to assume that um, if you if you listen and take notes and then meet with me during office hours that you'll figure it out, okay? Because I do tell you that and so I'm going to move to the next material. Um, so the rest of the day today, we're going to do utilitarianism. Um, so the main point here is make sure I'm recording. Yep. The main point with utilitarianism is that it also thinks it's following science, all right? This is another point of view that arose out of the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, the technological revolution. And this is the one that a lot of your classes are based on, your science classes, and I think also your social science classes. Now you can think about what are all the classes, what kind of reasoning are you expected to be doing, all right? So in an economics class, do you start out assuming people are rational if they calculate their own economic self-interest? That was John Locke's view of rational. Is that how your economics class begins? I don't know, but that would be a very Locke point of view. Right, and it comes out of the enlightenment. All right, so this one is the one that claims to really be based on facts. The other guys might say they're based on facts, like John Locke might say that, but he talks about rights. Rights aren't facts. So the utilitarians say, we're the ones that really talk about facts. Now, for this class, okay, this is a three hour class. It's, you know, four hours of homework at least. So what I give you is I give you five pages to read from Bentham. And then I give you an outline. So that's what I'll talk about. The outline covers the reading. So again, you can cheat. I'll never know for sure if you ever read it. Um, but I, but as a college teacher, I, I create a college level class. AUW has a reputation as a good college. I, I can't water it down, right? I have to give you what I think is a legitimate uh, assignment for the, this quality of education. Um, so I'll go over Bentham in just a minute, but let me explain how this assignment works, what I had in mind. These are very, very famous books, right? They're classics because they give a very simple description. It's, it's not hard to understand of a point of view that's had a very profound effect. So that's why we read it. It's affecting developing countries in horrible, horrible ways. So it's so important to you. I, I cannot impress upon you enough how much your countries are being harmed 
by these mindsets. So I would just hope that you will, you know, get it and be motivated to study it. So then I had the five pages from Mill and I had an outline on Mill. Then I have five pages or so, four pages on Mill on Liberty. And so that's what the student was saying about freedom, free speech. This is, this is um, like the Bible for setting up a society based on free association, free speech, free intellectual inquiry, right? John Stuart Mill's book on liberty is the absolute classic. And um, I give you just five pages, right? Uh, chapter two is the classic of the classic. If you ever wanted to pursue it further, that would be it. And then I give you the outline of it. Um, his his uh, great testimony, testament to freedom, a free and open society. What is a free and open society? Okay. And then I give you a news article that our pursuit of happiness, the, the way utilitarianism is applied today is destroying life on earth, okay? And Mr. Trow understands this and he understands that it is caused, the underlying um, view of reality is John Stuart Mill, right? Uh, the foundation of classical liberalism and John Stuart Mill's principle that every individual is free to speak and act as he wishes, all right? So my point here is that these documents that I'm having you read are having this profound effect on the destruction of life on earth. All right, so let me start at the beginning. Um, so I give you a reading here, give you sort of the general gist of what you're gonna, what I'll cover and I'll cover it today. We have like an hour and a half and then I'll let you go. And then next week, I'll cover it again. And you need to be prepared. You need to come with three points. You could have written those points down during this class, but you, but you go back and read and cover them in, before the next class. Okay, now, all right. The utilitarians completely disagree with Kant, all right? So science is supposed to have told us the truth about the natural world, about human nature, and about how to construct a good culture. So people during the Enlightenment thought they could literally re-engineer human nature, and we would not have evil anymore, okay? You're going to condition people out of what the church called sin, okay? Lust, greed, sloth, pride, vanity, jealousy, and wrath, anger. We are going to literally create a society where people have enough stuff so that they're not fighting against each other and they are conditioned to have uh, virtues, to be, want to be moderate. Science has enabled them to have health and relative security and safety and good housing and everybody's gonna be happy. Okay, this was utopia, except that they really believed they could do it. They really did. But this is how to do it, is Bentham's claim, is that as a matter of fact, we are a kind of animal. The only thing that motivates us, the only thing that motivates us is pleasure and pain. This is exactly the opposite of Kant, okay? Kant said 
No, we should never be motivated by pleasure and pain and inclination. We should always be motivated by a good will. We have freedom from pleasure and pain. That is our ultimate dignity is to act on freedom and freedom tied to reason. Okay, so the utilitarians say, no, that's not human nature at all. Everything we think of as right and wrong, as of infinite worth, every value we ever had is determined by pleasure and pain. And Bentham says, we're not going to have any sort of science of human nature and science of how to condition people to act virtuously unless we recognize that we have to do it through pleasure and pain. We have to have incentives and disincentives. We have to treat people like herd animals. <laughs> where you poke them this way with the pleasure and they'll behave that way. And you poke them that way with the pain and they behave that way. And you do all that poking and pretty soon you can condition people to be good, okay? And we discover all of this through reason, but reasoning means looking at the facts, studying the facts about pleasure and pain, and then constructing a system that uses pleasure and pain. So the science of human nature is the science of pleasure and pain. Um, the study of pleasure and pain. Um, all right, so what's the principle? The principle, every value you have, everything that's good or bad is always has to be judged according to whether it increases the happiness of human beings. And that means pleasure or the absence of pain. And um, so you, so it's every, you count the number of individuals and every individual counts the same. So whatever actions will maximize the pleasure of each of individuals is what you should legislate. The laws you create should be based on molding people through pleasure and pain. Um, okay, so an object or a law or an action uh, promotes utility if it promotes happiness or prevents unhappiness. The interest of the community so this language about interests, it comes up again and again in environmental ethics. So the articles that we're going to read in the future about specific issues like carbon in the air or um, biodiversity or air pollution, water pollution, every one of those articles refers back to Kant or Locke or Bentham or Mill. That's why you do need to read these documents because everything builds from there. So the interest of the community means the interests or the pleasures and pains of the members of the community. You, what they're getting at is you can't say oh, the community is so important that we have to deny you of your own pleasures or we have to give you pain, right? For the community's sake. And they don't forget that. We're just going to count individuals. Each one counts the same. And that's the interest of the community is just you add together all the individuals and that's it. Um, all right. So an action, we're focused on actions. We're not focused on beliefs like Kant. If you believe you're following the moral law, he couldn't care less. Bentham, forget it. That has nothing to do with anything. It's your actions. 
and the consequences of your actions. So Kant said you shouldn't ever worry about the consequences. Bentham says that's the only thing you should worry about. You shouldn't, it doesn't matter at all if you thought you were acting from a goodwill. What matters is the consequences of your actions. This is difficult to grasp, except that this battle between the dualists and the empiricists is constantly playing itself out throughout the world in the culture and in the relation between culture and nature. Um, okay, so an action which conforms to utility, maximize happiness, minimize unhappiness, is conformable to the principle of utility. Um, all right. An action that is conformable, that will maximize happiness, is what ought to be done. Okay. And Bentham says nobody really disagrees. Everybody really acts this way. They just don't admit it. So how does he show that? Well, suppose someone tries to discard the principle of utility, right? They say that's like Kant. That's just treating us like animals. We don't really act on the basis of pleasure and pain. We act on the basis of the moral law, or we act on the basis of God's will, what we think God wants us to do. That's not pleasure and pain. Sometimes, you know, it's painful to act according to God's will or what we think of, or sometimes it's painful to follow the moral law, okay? Um, and so how does Bentham um, address that? He says, well, I'll tell you, when people try to discard utility, what is really going on? Well, he gets pleasure when other people approve him. People get pain when other people judge them or condemn them, right? So if you think you're acting on other people's approval or disapproval, you're really acting on pleasure and pain. Um, if, if somebody only wants to act on their own opinion without thinking about the effect on other people, he's being uh, a despot, right? He's being a tyrant. That's evil. It's evil not to think about the consequences of your action. Um, if he wants everyone to just act on their own opinion without, okay, if someone wants everyone to act on their opinion, they're a tyrant. If someone wants everyone to act however they want, it's chaos, right? So people should act on the basis of maximizing pleasures. Okay, let's see. All right, so he's just saying basically in the, in the final analysis, you act on the basis of what you think is God's will because it gives you pleasure to act on what you think is God's will. You don't know that. You're really acting on the way you were conditioned to feel pleasure or pain. Same with Kant's moral law. You're, you were conditioned to feel pleasure. So you put that expression in there, your duty, but really you're just acting on pleasure and pain. But you should care about the consequences of your actions. Because if you think it's God's will and it makes you happy, but it makes a whole lot of other people miserable, that's wrong, right? You're being a despot. You're deciding God's will at everyone else's expense. Um, and so he does not admire that at all. So what is it that motivates our pleasures and pains, right? What, there are four sources of pleasures and pains, right? Physical, political, 
moral or religious, all right? So if it's physical, um, it's called the physical sanction, okay? So if, if you touch a hot stove, you know, that's pleasure and pain. That'll drive your behavior. If you're threatened with getting, um, uh, putting in prison or getting hit physically, or um, if you run a red light, the threat is that somebody will hit you, you know, hurt you. So whenever there's the threat of physical pain or the threat of being locked up, some physical punishment, that's the physical sanction of pleasure and pain. And people do, that controls people's behaviors is their fear of physical pain. Um, then there's another pleasure and pain that comes from uh, the political sanction. Okay, so the physical sanction is, is getting hurt. The second sanction is getting put in jail, that's the political sanction, or getting, um, anyway, that's the main one. If it comes from the community making judgments about you, um, if you, people fear the pain of having people judge you or condemn you, or, um, Right, or people are motivated by the idea that other people will honor you or praise you. So that's, again, pleasure and pain. And it comes from the moral or popular sanction or um, rewards and punishments. If the pleasure comes from God, right, it's the religious sanction, which is you're gonna be happy for eternity living in some paradise or you're gonna roast in hell, right? So what Bentham is saying is that you might say it's God's will, but actually behind that, it's pleasure and pain. That's what really drives people. Um, okay, suppose someone's goods are consumed by fire. If it's an accident, you call it a calamity. If it's personal neglect, it's the physical sanction. Um, if, um, say, your house was so um, filled with mold and pests and disease that, that a judge actually said you have to burn, burn the house down because there's um, too many germs in that house they're going to spread all over. So that would be the political sanction. Um, that doesn't happen very often anymore, but it used to happen. Um, if due to a neighbor's perception of the person as immoral, and so they were not willing to help when they saw the fire, they didn't call the police, that would be the moral sanction because your the fact that people had a bad opinion about you led to pleasure, I mean, pain, right? That's the moral sanction. You got, um, you got hit with a lot of pain because of your moral standing. Um, we don't know the pleasures and pains of a future life, but we know that religion can, be, can use pleasure and pain. Um, so the physical sanction is the foundation of everything else. So that's the first thing, is to say that what really drives us is pleasure and pain, just like other animals. We're more complicated, but it's the same ultimate source of our motivation. And the second, yeah? Okay, uh, can you explain that example a bit? Because I, I don't think I got the relation. Okay, so why don't you give me an example of something that you think is not motivated by pleasure and pain? Something you do. Um, 
something like I personally do. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's a lot. There's lots of things, right, Professor? Go ahead. Uh, I mean, just go ahead and, and tell me, and then I'll try to act like Bentham and tell you. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Just okay. give me an example. That's fine. So, like, if. Okay, so whatever I'm thinking about, I keep backtracking and guessing, okay, but it could be this. <laughs> <laughs> That's what and I, go ahead. I mean, even, even if it's, I guess, even if it's directly not related to pleasure and pain, it's like, when I think about it, it's indirectly, either it's like uh, about, so societal pressure or just uh, how people see me or anything so everything is like motivated by something so, that's right that's right so see if somebody else can somebody just say i know for sure that when i pray five times a day that's not motivated by pleasure and pain right and bentham will say oh yes it is it's motivated by this desire yeah. for evil, right? <laughs> yeah, the fear or just the desire of heaven or whatever. Right. Or just the approval of Allah, right? Or the fear. Yeah. That's what that's what Bentham would say. What about, oh, but I really care about my friends, right? I mean, I take time out for them so that I, you know. Uh, instead of studying, I will help my friend in trouble, right? Because yeah. I love my friend. And Bentham will say, no, I mean, you care about the approval of your friend, right? You get yeah. pleasure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, good. You're, you're starting to get it. Can anybody else give what they think is a counterexample? Like, it's not pleasure. or fear, right? Pain. <laughs> All right, so people can, again, write in their posts about that, right? But I do want you to think about this huge debate between Kant and religious leaders and utilitarians. They really are fighting it out for what motivates us. Um, mm -hmm. But why does it have to be like, why does it have to be black and white? That's what I'm thinking. Like, if I like, uh, if when I'm thinking about Kant, he's saying it's all about like moral values and stuff. So yeah, that's true too. But when we are talking about pleasure and pain, that's true as well. So it's a mixture of all of these things. So. Right. I know, and that's the trouble in the Enlightenment. They really did want you to just pick one, right? And John Locke is the other one, right, right? You're supposed to be motivated by calculating your rights, maximizing your rights. Does that make sense, Sauda? Yeah, I mean, I mean, in most people's cases, that's the thing that motivates us, right? <laughs> well, okay, so Locke would say, I have a right to free speech and I have a right to property. And Bentham would say, you know, the reason you say that is because you think if everybody has a right to property and everybody's given this, that that will maximize happiness. Otherwise, if you just think, well, I have a right to property and you don't, then you're being a tyrant, right? Um, but in general, when people say, I have a right to vote, it really means that'll maximize everybody's happiness is everybody has is free and equal and has a right to vote and a right to speak. Does that make sense, Soda? 
Yes. And also, just as you're talking about this, I found one thing that doesn't motivate me by pleasure or pain. That's voting. Voting? <laughs> yes. <laughs> because Actually. I don't, yeah, like last year, I had to vote for the first time, like in the national vote and whatever. And I went to vote, but I didn't have any desire to go out there and vote or whatever. My mom's just, mom was just telling me you should vote. I mean, even if you don't want to just go and, you know, since your first time, you should like, have an experience. Even if you, if you don't feel like voting for anyone, just do the, like, there's option for you to, to not choose anyone. So just do that, say no. <laughs> So I did, but even though I knew that it doesn't matter what, even if I go or not go and whatever, it doesn't matter because everything is already corrupt and fixed anyway. So if I don't go, it won't matter. Okay, so what's the debate? See, that's what you're thinking. You're thinking about the consequences, right? You're thinking about it's not gonna maximize happiness. Right? Do you see what I mean? That's what Bentham would say. The reason why you don't want to vote is because it's not going to increase the happiness of anybody, the pleasure or the absence of pain. It will just be painful for me to go and vote. It's just annoying. And it's nobody else, there's no other consequence. Whereas your mother probably thinks that if people get in the habit of voting, they'll get in the habit of asking their political leaders to be accountable and things will get better. If people your age don't vote, things won't get better. So she's probably thinking long-term consequences. Does that make sense, Saude? Yeah. Okay. This is without necessarily consciously uh, thinking. Professor. Go ahead. Yes, also uh, like one thing uh, on the other point of view, like doesn't voting can also bring pleasure. Like if I vote the person, I want to be the leader. I like, I want whom to be the leader. And if that person wins and then it can, it does bring the, brings the pleasure. Right, but, but um, let's see. What's the name? Saudi was thinking that that it's too corrupt and it's not going to make any difference, right? Whereas you're assuming that it does make a difference, right? So you're calculating. Yes. What you're doing is you're calculating the overall happiness differently, but you are acting on the basis of your calculations. <laughs> does that does everybody understand that? Uh, yeah, yes, Professor. Anybody else have a an example of something you think is not motivated by utility? Okay. All I right. don't think there's anything, Professor. Well, like, that's... even if I go ahead. Uh, so even if I'm like feeding the straight cat in my like neighborhood it's still like i mean it's still it, you can see it as like act of selflessness and whatever but it still brings me pleasure right like i'm in i like cats so i'm like, like thinking oh this is like cute or whatever i or i just want to help them but why do I want to help them? Like helping them brings me pleasure, whether it's emotional or, you know. So yeah. it's still motivated by like happiness. Right. So that's when you hear people saying that Westerners are individualistic and they're materialistic. And you know, all these stereotypes about the West, especially the individualism, if you think about it, John Locke has these individual profit, profit maximizers, right? Everybody's free and equal and they calculate 
the most efficient means to their own economic self-interest. They work hard on the land, they make it prosper, right? And um, the government should, should only protect them against somebody trying to take their stuff, right? So that's individualistic and it's materialistic. Now Kant is individualistic, right? You and your free will are telling yourself the moral law, you think it ought to be universal, but you can't ever say that, you, you can't let the culture affect what you think is pure reason. So the notion of pure reason, the individual acting on the basis of pure reason and, and acting in a way that they think conforms to a universal law, that's still between you and yourself. And then this one, utilitarianism, is that each individual counts as one, but everybody is acting in a way that maximizes happiness, but it's pleasure and pain. So it's my pleasure and pain, and then it's counting you know, everybody else's pleasure and pain. It's still very individualistic and very materialistic. Do you understand that? Does anybody, does that make sense to people? That this is, this is West, the West, whereas traditional cultures are very community oriented. And so your identity is caught up in being somebody's child and somebody's sibling and somebody's niece or nephew and being belonging to a certain community or nationality or religion. So your identity is all caught up in these other bigger groups. But the West was determined to give people a consciousness of themselves as individuals. And so the advantage of that, right? The free and open society, free speech, free enterprise, you know, America is the land of opportunity. People can come and get out of there, of the class and race and ethnicity um, prisons that they're, they grow up in. So that's the advantage. The disadvantage is it's very self-oriented, right? And it's materialistic. So there's advantages and disadvantages to this. But the problem is, in terms of our relation to the environment, it's all bad. <laughs> There's not, the advantages are we got to a certain level of material well being. The disadvantages is it's, there was no limit built into the models of reason and virtue and happiness and all that stuff. They never put any limit on this. Um, anybody else want to ask a question? Because really, um, I can stop for a minute. Otherwise, I'll, I'll talk about how on earth do you calculate, right? So everything you do should maximize pleasures, minimize pains. Well, how on earth am I going to calculate that? So this is called the hedonistic calculus. And the word hedonistic is a Greek word meaning pleasure. So you're calculating pleasures. How do you do this? Um, and this is the legislator, right? The person who makes the laws. Um, has to deal with pleasures and pains. And if they're a good legislator, they make laws that maximize pleasures, right? Well, how do you calculate it? Well, the intensity of the pleasure, how each individual, right? If take each individual affected by this law, is, is the pleasure or pain, how intense is it? How long lasting is it? How certain is it or uncertain that it's going to actually happen? Is it immediate or remote? So sometimes a law can be made where it's intensely unpleasant for the first week, 
But then after that, it gets better. Um, so I suppose what with COVID, it would be um, wearing masks, right? Somehow in America, that was very unpleasant. I mean, you could say that people didn't want to wear masks just because of the pleasure. You could say because it was the principle, the government was interfering in my life or because the government is treating me as a means only, not as an end in myself, right? You could use any of those languages to argue for why I don't want to wear a mask, but mostly you're putting yourself first, right? And then you try to convince yourself that the pain of wearing a mask and the pain and this is what people were saying. They, I don't know if you were, if this happened to you, but there were people saying, well, we should just not do anything and get and let everyone who's going to get it get it, and everyone who's going to die die. And then we'll have herd immunity on the other side of that. There were people in America that thought that was how to maximize pleasures and minimize pains over time because and you know people disagreed obviously uh, let's see so people and the legislators in Texas and certain southern states were advocating that approach and they did it on the basis of utility um, or on the basis of John Locke minimal government intervention. Um, all right. Let's see. Oh, yeah. It's chance of being followed by more pleasures or pains. It's purity. Um, so, uh, professor. Go ahead. Yeah. So the, the, so the last law was also like, it was also, it has also the impact of John Locke's freedom law. The mask mandates? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The in America. Pleasure and pain. Like they're um, calculating this with the freedom. Like the more freedom, the more pleasure, the less pain. Right. So, Saristi, usually the language they use is the language of rights, right? I have a right to do what I want. And the government has no right to intervene. But, and that's if you are a strict lock, minimal government. But if you're a utilitarian, you'll say, I have a right not to wear a mask because the overall pleasures of, well, the other thing was not to shut our economy down. There were people who thought it was absolutely wrong for the government to interfere in our economy because it's a free market. So anybody who wanted to keep their business open should be able to keep their business open. Nobody should have to wear a mask if the business owners don't want them to. And of course you get more business if you say, you don't have to wear a mask, you don't have to social distance, you can come to my business, right? And, um, so the John Locke types were saying that, right? The government shouldn't control anything. Now the utilitarians, some of them were saying the overall pleasures and pains would indicate that we do have to shut down the economy or we have to you know, cut back. But there were other utilitarians saying, no, no, the overall pleasures and pains just let everybody get it who's going to get it and die who's going to die because overall everybody will be have more happiness <laughs> so utilitarians disagreed and okay does that help sristi yes it's a little bit complicated though the thing the thing that's important is for you to compare that with how people in your countries thought about it so I'm really curious, you know? Yeah. Did anybody talk about the government's right, has no right to intervene? Or do you just assume the government does intervene 
more than it does in America. I'm sorry, Professor, can you repeat? Did anybody in your country say the government has no right to tell me to wear a mask or not? Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of people no, that I think they actually don't care. They actually don't care about what the government is going to say. They're like, they're doing whatever they want and they don't wear a mask. Mask. There is like a lot of people in the street that don't wear a mask. Yeah, and then you could, you could figure out if it, is it because they have lots point of view or if it's just they just don't want to think about it. Um, yeah, I think they, they just uh, they just don't care about it. Yeah, yeah okay. I, the second they're one, like professor. ignorant, ignorant of uh, all these yeah. laws and everything. Most of, in most cases, that's it. Because I think most people, like the people who doesn't wear a mask, it's not that they don't care. I think it's just they don't know the importance. They don't think it's as important. And so they just, you know, don't do it. Right. So anybody else want to want to speculate about why people would or would not wear masks in your... Also, Professor, I think there is a tendency between uh, people uh, like different people, like they want, to, they likes to go against the rules, the government rules, and that's why they do directly the opposite what the government says. Okay. Anybody else want to have an opinion about what they think the the reasons people have for wearing them or not wearing them? I mean, I actually like. So for me, I have different experiences because instead of like people not caring about government and all of that, I've seen like more people saying government is not doing enough. Government is hiding stuff. Government is not counting like the COVID count properly. They're just, you know, lying to us and they, they're not doing their job properly. And like, even with the vaccines, they're like, they don't care enough. They're not, you know, properly regulating the vaccines and all. And they're not properly, you know, regulating the rules, like enforcing the rules of wearing masks and everything. That's why a lot of people still doesn't know about the coronavirus or they don't, you know, know the importance of it because government hasn't spread it enough. They didn't do enough. That's what yeah. I... Okay, so, right. Okay, so this is good because, especially with utilitarianism, with John Stuart Mills, on the one hand, utilitarianism, on the other hand, on liberty, that there's this huge contradiction in Western thought about issues like this. And on the one hand, people uh, want a free market, freedom, blah, 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 but they don't want the freedom to destroy life on earth, right? They don't want the freedom to not, you know, to have so much air pollution, they get sick, but that's what a free market does. And so, and so people are really conflicted and they contradict themselves a lot. And it has partly to do with how are you calculating utility? Are you calculating the happiness, the pleasure and pain of people today or tomorrow? Or are you calculating in 10 years or 20 years when the climate explodes, right? When the disruptions get worse and worse. And so we are going to talk about that throughout the semester. Um, so, I, so I, again, I want to impress on you that this looks like philosophy, like it's, just this isolated system. But everything we read after this, in terms of the particular issues, they always get crammed back into these categories. And, um, uh, you know, that's a good, that's a main reason why we can't get anything done. Um, it's true that China, you know, is 
there's the roads program or something, whatever it's called. They're definitely expanding, but they're doing it, I'm sure, in the name of some good, right? Like we're developing the economies and, you know, it's a free, it's, they don't call it a free market. They call it socialism with a Chinese character, <laughs> which means capitalism with regulations by the Chinese government. Uh, but in the US, you can't ever call anything socialism. You call it capitalism with an American character, which would be Medicare, <laughs> government intervention, but it's really capitalism, right? So there is this huge, you know, conflict between how much should the government control and how much should the private economy control. And that's a huge debate, but the utilitarians will always say, which thing in this case, which law, how enforced, blah, blah, maximizes happiness, minimizes unhappiness. Whereas Locke maximizes freedom and um, a free market, freedom to work hard and create value or um, so that's what Locke looks for. And then Kant is, you know, uh, you're not supposed to worry about consequences at all. You're supposed to act on principle. So I'll give you a couple examples of that in a minute. Um, let me just do this for a sec. This is the this is the chart or the list of how to calculate the pleasures and pains. And all I want to give you a sense of is how dang complicated it is, right? How intense for each person equally, its intensity, how long it's going to last, whether it actually, this pleasure, or this pain is actually going to be a result. Um, and whether it's immediate or long term, um, whether one pleasure or pain is likely to be followed by more, whether or whether it's not likely to be followed by its opposite, right? So, so you know, you get a shot for COVID and you have sort of a reaction. And that's unpleasant for a couple of days, but the overall pleasure is that now you won't get COVID and or you can go outside and you can mingle and you can do all this stuff. So the overall pleasures are way greater than pains. Um, but people who refuse to get vaccinated are some of them are, I don't want the government intervening in my life. I have a right to say no, but other ones are just afraid, right? They're just afraid of possible consequences. And that's why they're not getting the vaccine. But they're only thinking about possible consequences to themselves. They're not thinking about public health. Or they're not thinking about the fact, right, that they could infect someone else. Not just be infected by someone else, but they could infect someone else. The frontline workers are more vulnerable. They can get infected when people don't get vaccines. But the Comcast guy that put in my Comcast last week, he's worried about overall effect like on our reproductive organs or something. So he read something about these long-term effects. So he's afraid that's, but he's measured, right? That pleasures and pains according to, again, who knows? How legitimate was that based on science or was that, you know, some kind of conspiracy theory or what? So it gets super complicated, um, super fast. But in the end, Bentham thinks we still have to use this model because this is what we know is pleasures and pains. I mean, if you start arguing about God's will, oh my gosh, people do anything. We've got to tie it to something concrete. And if you go with Kant, 
people really disagree on what reason requires. And we, and you know, to say reason requires this and ignore consequences, forget it. Like you could be a dictator and do that, you know? And so we got to look at consequences on real people. And um, then Locke, right? Locke will say, no, some things have to do with rights and it doesn't matter what the consequences. And one example of that in my country is the right to bear arms, right? The right to have as many guns as you want, the right to have as many guns as you want when someone in your household is diagnosed man manic depressive. We, you can still buy as many guns as you want. The right to have AK-47 machine guns. That's a matter of principle, even though it mows down people, it kills people, right? So Bentham would say, wait a sec, that's what the Democrats, the Democrats are always saying the consequences of this is awful. We've got to have some regulations on guns because of the number of deaths, right? So the Democrats tend to be utilitarians, whereas the conservatives tend to, to refer to God's will or absolute principles or rights anything other than utility, okay? Um, I'll give some more examples of that in a minute. Um, I'm trying to, to, I'm trying, I'm hoping that you can take what I'm saying and apply it to your countries or your contexts. Um, it's, it's relevant that people in the US think this way because we are polluting the world. But I also want you to sort of sort through it in your own minds with your own countries and with the way the best and the brightest students in your countries are being educated. Are they being educated in, in one of these ways of thinking? Um, let's see. So that's the calculus for pleasures and pains. Now, here's the, the next, let me give you a couple examples of how this is crazy, goes crazy in the US. Let, and again, I think all of you and all your countries deal with abortion, right? So a, a person who considers it God's will, right? God does not want abortions and they should be illegal. Well, somebody in my country says, wait a second, separating church and state. Like your religion might think that and you better not get one if you think you're going to hell. But the government can't decide if a fertilized egg has a soul or not, right? And so the government allows for abortion until the fetus can live outside the womb and then it has rights as a citizen. So that's where the US has been recently. It's just that science makes it easier for uh, fetuses to live outside the womb at a younger age, but there's still the religious people and there's also the Kantian types that would say, you know, it's absolutely wrong we must treat rational nature as an end in itself, right? And so a fertilized egg of a human being is a rational nature, right? Um, so that's a matter of principle, right? Not consequences, it's a principle that a government that functions by reason would make abortion illegal, okay? The Democrats basically say, look, when you make it illegal, there's more abortions with an S, right? The consequences of making it illegal actually lead to more abortions, all right? So the Democrats would say, we want to minimize the number of abortions. And the best way to do that is to keep it legal, but to have teenage sex education, to have contraceptives available, to have Planned Parenthood where people go to get contraceptions to prevent abortions. So Planned Parenthood does more to prevent abortions than any other organization. 
Now, the fact that sometimes they do abortion referrals means that the other side is trying to shut down Planned Parenthood because in principle, they allow for abortion. So this is one case where the difference between a principle and consequences for how does the legislator make laws, okay? That's one. Another one is guns. Another one is um, gay, gay rights, right? Someone could say, oh no, it's absolutely wrong. Um, well, if your religion says so, fine. You don't allow them to be members of your church, but the government can't say so. Science doesn't say it's a perversion. There's no evidence that these people are sexual predators, all this stuff. So from the government's point of view, they ought to be given the same legal rights, right? And so there's this big argument about gay rights. And on the one side are the utilitarians, and on the other side are Christians or some sort of Kantian absolute, right? A government that allows for gay rights is an evil government and, you know, it's wrong. All right, so that's another one. Um, healthcare is an issue that's debated. Do citizens have a right to healthcare? Well, John Locke would say, no, <laughs> you know, the only rights, the only government is a military and the police. But I talked about that before, right? And then the Democrats will say, but if you have the public option, you can actually control the cost. So the cost is cheaper. You get more healthcare at, at a lower price if you have public healthcare. That's a utilitarian uh, argument. The lock argument is that citizens don't have a right to health care. They should work hard and make money and save it for their health care and buy health care on the private market, um, free enterprise. So on and on and on. It's just that from the point of view of environment, <laughs> it's, it's all of these people have kept exploiting the environment. And um, this is the big problem. This is how, why the US doesn't deal with it. And then I just really wonder how your countries deal with it, right? How do people think about the fact that they know the climate is changing because they're being affected by it? It's right in front of their eyes. So how do they deal with it in terms of what the government should or shouldn't do? That's that's what you need to sort of sort out in your head. But here's the other, here's, um, I guess I, I just have half an hour. So I have to start out, there's three aspects. Well, four kind of points in this lecture. The first one is that pleasure and pain motivate us. The second one is Mill's book on utilitarianism. And he writes a whole book about how do you create a society based on utilitarianism? How do you set up all these um, institutions, habits, ways of motivating people, molding people's characters so that they take pleasure in good things? And so his, Again, I only have four pages. Um, he starts out, the foundation is this happiness principle, maximize pleasure, minimize pain. Then he says, wait a second, this doesn't mean low pleasures like eating, drinking, and sex, right? He says, no, no, we have, we have a sense of our own dignity and we, human beings um, have faculties more elevated than the animal appetites. And when they're made conscious of these faculties, 
they insist that these higher faculties be stimulated. And so what he's saying, he says that there are higher pleasures. Mental pleasures are higher in quality and intensity than bodily pleasures, right? And they also have all these other utilitarian consequences. They have advantages. Um, so there's two ways. They're a higher quality of pleasure, and they also have more positive consequences. And what are those pleasures? They are the pleasures of intellectual interchange, intellect, the feelings, which he says the feeling of empathy with other people in the same species, and imagination, the arts, the pleasures of a free imagination, free scientific inquiry, free artistic expression, those are the higher pleasures. And um, the, the way that you can prove that these are higher pleasures, more desirable pleasures, is if, if um, people are presented with bodily pleasures versus higher pleasures, if people are acquainted with both of them, they will consistently choose the higher pleasures. He's saying you could do an, an experiment, like a science experiment. Those people who are equally acquainted with and equally capable of appreciating both give a preference to the higher pleasures. All right. Um, so, and he, you know, he talks about that. Now, um, let's see. Okay, so that's that. my main point here is that he thinks there are these higher pleasures and you can prove it through scientific experiment with people. Um, now, what that means is every college educated student especially if you're in liberal arts school and you had to take an art class or a music class, you would never choose the lower pleasures, right? Isn't that true? Once you've been exposed, nobody with a liberal arts degree would ever choose gluttony or sloth or greed or pride, <laughs> right? And uh, like, I don't think that's true, you know? Not everybody who graduates from Yale and Harvard is, you know, wallowing in the pleasures of the intellect and empathy with other people and um, the arts. As a matter of fact, a lot of them are really greedy, um, vulgar, <laughs> low lives, right? Like Donald Trump, for example. Um, Donald Trump graduated from Penn or something. Um, yeah, I think, I think he miscalculated somewhere along the way. And so um, the context within which he grew up was empiricism, the belief that we're a blank slate. You can condition people to prefer the higher pleasures. You just have to raise children with exposure to these higher pleasures. And if they get exposed so they can really appreciate those pleasures, they will choose them. When they become adults, they will choose the higher pleasures. So the greatest happiness principle, um, this is determinism. The essence of our conscience, our sense of right and wrong is just a matter of conditioning. It's based on all of our experiences and nothing other than that, right? We don't have this goodwill that's a priori, complete rejection of that. This is determinism. We can't base morality on character. That's Aristotle, right? It's just experiences. How do you prove it? How do you prove everyone that you should base your principle on happiness because everybody seeks it. Everybody avoids unhappiness. So the only way to prove it is to say, 
that's actually what goes on in the world. You know, what more proof do you need? But the nature of pleasure, oh, the higher pleasures, that's what we really mean by pleasure, the nature of happiness. Okay, you should really <laughs> think about this. The happiness which utilitarians meant was not a life of rapture, but moments of such in an existence made up of few and transitory pains, many and various pleasures with the predominance of the active, the intellect, empathy, imagination, over the passive, which would be eating, drinking, and sex, the foundation not to expect more from life. How many people really think of happiness that way? And if they did, of course, we wouldn't have very many problems in society if everybody were mature. But you know what? They're not. So now what do we do? Um, then desiring the happiness of others is natural. There's this natural sentiment, which is empathy with other people. The social feelings of, of humankind, the desire to be at unity with our fellow creatures. Okay, so he's saying empathy is natural and you can build a whole culture on empathy. Empathy and higher pleasures. Um, okay, most of our actions are for the benefit of the people around us, but, but if we have empathy, that will also benefit other people. Okay, um, capacity for noble feelings, um, is a tender plant. In most people, it dies away because they get beaten down by society. But um, it's possible to cultivate these uh, higher pleasures and interest in other people. And so we need to make good laws. If we condition people correctly, they will grow up to be mature like this, okay? Higher pleasures, feeling of unity. Who's gonna run the, the society? Well, who's gonna be able to structure society so that everybody does seek these higher pleasures? Well, it has to be people who just happen to be lucky and they were raised to seek these higher pleasures. They would know how to do it, how to organize society. Well. Uh, who's to say? <laughs> Here's the problem. Mill, okay, does everybody get this idea that utilitarianism is based on determinism, the blank slate? You have to condition kids from when they're young to take pleasure in higher pleasures. Um, and if and people who were raised that way would be able to know how to structure things. So that was one book that Mill wrote. He wrote another book on liberty. The subject of this essay is liberty, on liberty. And his simple principle is that, um, let's see, let's see, the, the only end for which human beings are warranted to interfere in the liberty of action of anyone else is self-protection. Otherwise, people should be allowed to live however they like. You can't intervene in their life for their own good. You can't compel them to do things because you think it's better, because you think it'll make them happy, um, because you think it would be wiser. You just let everybody live as they like, okay? And so he has this, his book is the Bible of the free and open society. And he argues, okay, he argues for social evolution. Um, nobody is saying, hopefully we've gotten over the idea that we have to actually defend the liberty of the press, right? Of course, everybody at this point in history knows that liberty of the press, freedom of press 
is necessary against a corrupt or tyrannical government. I think in the United States, Donald Trump was always condemning the media, right? Because he wanted control of the media or he wanted people to ignore our media so that he could be more powerful. So I don't think, I think Mill was a little optimistic to think that it would never be questioned. It is being questioned. Um, let's see. Uh, I, I think that you ought to go through this argument. It's interesting. It's an argument for minimal government. And, and in an ideal society, every opinion should be considered because nobody's absolutely right. Or because even if something is really wrong, you have to have reasons. You have to publicly explain why it's wrong. He also thinks that people have a natural desire to know the truth and a natural ability to self-correct. So that when people hear all these opinions, they will in the long run come out with the right opinion. I can't remember where, um, which page, yeah, okay. All right, the people, if you have a completely free and open society in the long run, um, the truth will come out. So you could think about this. Do you believe this? Does this make sense to you? Um, let's see. Ah, here's, here's the rub. In the case of children, if, you, if parents are not raising their children correctly, the state should be able to take them away. And the state should forbid marriages unless the parties can show they can support a family. So he's assuming people don't get divorced when their kids are little. He's assuming, you know, he's assuming people are gonna be parents are responsible. And if they're not, the state can come in and take them away because kids have to be conditioned or this whole system is not gonna work. It only applies to mature human beings, okay? Well, who gets to decide who is mature? <laughs> well, John Stuart Mill thought it was pretty obvious who's mature, right? But not everybody else thinks so. Um, let's see. There's a preponderance among humankind of rational opinions and rational conduct. Is he right about that, right? You need to think about that. Um, all right. So here's the last thing is to have this debate. I used to do this in class. 30 years ago, okay, 30 years ago, between Donald Trump and John Stuart Mill, all right? What is happiness? Okay, what is Donald Trump gonna say happiness is? Anybody wanna answer that question? Nobody? Money and power, right? What does John Stuart Mill say happiness is? A life filled with the higher pleasures, not to expect too much, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay, what is pleasure? Donald Trump, ah, sex, money, power. That's, that's where he gets his pleasure. What does Mill say? Uh, intellectual pleasures, empathy with other people and uh, the arts, right? What is freedom? Donald Trump, freedom from government intervention, especially in the economy. What does Mill say? Uh, you know, freedom for everybody to um, have a, to, for the freedom is 
a society of mature individuals who then, once they're mature and they pick higher pleasures, they can live however they like. As long, I mean, assuming everybody knows higher pleasures are what counts. Who should rule? Donald Trump said, I should rule, right? Anybody who is motivated by money is, is going to be a good ruler because they'll know how to make the economy good. And the economy gives people the freedom to decide how they want to live. Um, what does John Stuart Mill say? John Stuart Mill says, uh, the people who should rule are the ones who condition people for higher pleasures and who have government intervention at, at any point where this isn't going, going well, the government should intervene and get it back on track. Um, what's the greatest happiness? For Mill, it's higher pleasures. For, for Trump, it's money, a gross domestic product. The, the overall economy, it doesn't matter how it's distributed, how the money is distributed. It just matters that it's growing. Who's contributing most? Donald Trump says he is. Uh, John Stuart Mill says he is. Who is raising their children well? Donald Trump. I teach them all to be as greedy as I am. And I give them, I hire them at my businesses. And they're all running my businesses. And they're happy. And John Stuart Mill will say, no, 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 no. It's the opposite of that. Um, so John Stuart Mill should think that Donald Trump's children should have been taken out of his home a long time ago to get reconditioned for the higher pleasures, right? Well, what do you guys think? Okay, anybody want to comment on that? It's just um, what each person defines as happiness, right? So it's initially both are driven by happiness, but it's just the definition of happiness are different from for both of them. So, and even if yeah, like we're judging each side It's, it's hard to, I mean, judge from uh, like a neutral perspective because even when I'm judging on taking sides, I, I will, or like I'm going to say this is the best one. I, I'll choose one to be the best one based on my values. So even though I would say like John uh, Locke or Stuart Mills here, they are like talking about more, like if we think about higher, higher pleasure that is, so that's the more right thing or that's the best, but then I have to think about like, it, am I being biased or not? So. <laughs> yeah, okay guys. Um... So if we are a blank slate, and if we get conditioned, how does a capitalist society want to condition us? To obviously want immediate physical pleasures, because that's how you sell people a lot of stuff. Does everybody understand that? Yes. So, yes, Professor. Yeah, OK. So. So what, what actually happened historically was that John Locke's view and Jeremy Bentham, remember Bentham's, oh, Bentham said, there's no higher or lower pleasures. People can do whatever they want as long as they're not hurting anybody else. Well, there's, and then you have John Locke's view of property, right? I have a right to my land. I take pleasure in working hard and creating value. 
Nobody can tell me what to do with my land. And so you add that onto utilitarianism, happiness is minimal government in the economic system. And that's how people get happy. And they work hard, they make money, and then they do with their money whatever they dang please, as long as they don't hurt somebody else. Well, the trouble is everything we do affects somebody else, especially when it comes to environment. Um, so that's where I that's where we're going, right? So you don't have to have sort of digested utilitarianism yet. Um, where we're going is I remember the students when I taught this before, they started to understand how the things that they wanted that made them happy, like makeup, or this one girl said her family was physically short and her brother was just obsessed about wanting to be taller. And so their family really shelled out a lot of money for all of these uh, products sold over the internet that were trying to convince them they could make him taller. And so they were getting sucked into this, right? But as long as there's minimal government intervention and everybody's free to do whatever makes them happy, as long as they don't hurt anybody else, what? <laughs> so that's how it is that all these products that either directly harm the environment or indirectly harm it because it's just consumerism gone wild, right? So there's just so much consumption and it takes fossil fuels to create the factories and to create the product and to ship the product. So the product itself might be pretty harmless, um, chapstick or something maybe perfume doesn't hurt too many people, but the whole process by which it's made and then the money spent on that rather than spent on taxes for environmental protection, some sort of environmental products like solar, you know, having the government put solar panels on people's um, roofs, just any sort of public health issue, public concern. This is what is not there, right? And if, however you put these different ideologies together, they're never gonna end up with sustainability because they weren't based on that. And so you have to really change the mindset. You might, keep the same ideas, but you've got to apply them in a completely different way. And that usually the mindset grows up with its application. Usually they're pretty difficult to separate. Um, so what happened in my country, which I hope it doesn't happen in yours, is that we just never got environmental laws proactive. We have to wait until some property owner can prove that the pollution from the person upstream is polluting his stream so much that his cows are getting sick, right? He's got to prove that he can't make as much money because this other guy is polluting something but he has to prove material evidence that you can't make money before there's any law against the pollution. It's not because nature should be respected or animals have any rights or anything. It's just, I can't make as much money. <laughs> and then if, geez, if somebody can't make money, ah, then the happiness the overall happiness goes down because happiness is how much money you can make. So it really did get reduced to greed. The original idea was this wonderful utopianism. We're gonna raise people to love moderation 
and love, you know, virtue and justice and all sorts of wonderful things. But that is not what happened, right? It got glued and pasted together so the corporations have all sorts of ways of thinking and ways of controlling the legal system and that and the political system that just perpetuates capitalism. So um, that's that's where I want to go with it. But the posts that you have to put, so it's step by step, right? So post first on Bacon and Locke, knowledge is power and the notion of rights and property rights. So first you get into that and post about that. Then you get into Kant and this notion of um, separating out your mathematical reasoning, your engineers, all those artificial intelligence people have separated themselves from the natural world. Animals don't have rights. Only reason is of infinite worth. So I want you to write a post about that, that mindset, right? What are the pros and cons of it? Um, just something about that. And then we will ultimately get to utilitarianism, but don't worry about that right now. It's just, that's where we're going next. And before the next class, you just have three reactions. Just read it over. You don't have to read it over super carefully. And then I've already talked about it quite a bit, but please come with something to say. I should be able to break you into groups right away and everybody would have something to say. So that's my goal, okay? And um, any other questions? We have like four minutes and then I'll stay after until everybody's satisfied. But mostly it's just the students who've come in late who are behind just start step-by-step step catching up with the class, okay. Um, Professor, just curious, uh, curious about one thing. Like, yeah, when you're talking about like, there's no environmental law in the U.S. until it involves money. But like, what about like destroying government property? Like, if you're polluting the, something public, don't you get you know? Isn't it illegal? Shouldn't there be like consequences about that? Or isn't there? Let's see. Um, well, can you give an example? I mean, people can destroy government property because they're demonstrating against, you know, <laughs> the law. But I here's mean, one. just for, just the example that you gave, like uh, polluting a stream. So. You said the other person has to, you know, prove that it's harming his uh, earnings or whatever, like his ab ability to make money and stuff. But even if it, it wasn't harming his, uh, like another person's uh, ability to make money or polluting their cow or whatever, it's still polluting a public place. It does like a stream should be a public property, right? And if someone in an individual is polluting that stream, that's also like harming or destroying public property. So Actually, that should be illegal. So, so Sada, that's really important because nobody owns the air and nobody owns the water. And so people could do whatever they wanted to the air and the water. That's why there's never been any laws against air and water or there weren't for a long time because nobody's responsible for it. But uh, like, it should be like, like natural resources are national property, right? Well, I mean, you have to worry about public health. 
right? Yeah. Obviously, Americans don't care about public health. They care more about their right not to wear a mask and not to get vaccinated. It's so bad. <laughs> yeah. um, there's other things that happen, like uh, corporations dumped a lot of poisons, like they would bury them in the earth, and then the, the poison would start coming bubbling up and people would get cancer. And um, there was a military base. Military bases were often put on these sites. So I had a student who had serious cerebral palsy and his mother died an early death of ovarian cancer. And they really do think his dad was in the military. The particular military base that they lived on, a lot of people were getting cancers. It was a toxic waste dump <laughs> site. But it's really hard for us to get laws against that because nobody owns it. And nobody's making money off of it. It's very sad. I have to let the rest of you go though. So um, I, I hope you can figure out how this applies to your country or how it applies to the way Western or even Chinese corporations come in and exploit. And it's all justified because it increases the, the economy and gives people jobs. Any other comments? Um, Professor, I would just like to say one thing. Um, about two weeks ago, this uh, ship lit on fire and uh, like about a few kilometers off the coast of Sri Lanka. And there was uh, this is huge, you know, oil spill and plastic pellets coating our beaches. Um, and apparently this ship was refused uh, entry to uh, so many countries, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and uh, nobody is talking about how, uh, who gave the permission for the ship to enter Sri Lankan waters. Um, there's talk of it being like the government is targeting the compensation money. But again, that's not going to reach the people and it's not going to help the environment. It's not going to reverse the damage. It's just going to the government. Yeah. <laughs> um... Yeah, so in your lifetime, however, Shazim, things will change, right? And I think philosophies will change, but there has to be a change of mind. People have to just develop a, a different worldview. I mean, they've got to cope. They have to figure out how we need to rethink we really have to rethink everything about our place in the natural world, right? And in order to do that, we've got to get rid of what we've thought in the past or seriously change the application of it. Does that make sense, Shan Shazneen? Yes, Professor. So I'm wondering- I think the problem lies in uh, like a corrupt government in our case. Yeah, it's just, yeah, but part, part of the corruption is that they can talk to the people in this language that's convincing to people, right? And they yeah. don't, yeah, and they don't rise up. Um, they don't think they have a right to clean air, or clean water, right? Um, yeah. So the, the trouble with that corruption of government is that government is the only solution too, because the free market is not gonna take care of it. Does that make sense, Shazneen? Yes, Professor. I mean, the profit motive is what caused this in the first place. People are just trying to make money. So governments have to intervene. And when the governments don't, or they benefit, then you're really in trouble, right? You, you have to find a new way to figure this out. Um, 
Yeah, it's going to be a long haul, but it's definitely going to happen. It's just when you ask, how did we get this far? How did it get this bad? Why didn't somebody step in a long time ago? That's what I can explain to you by looking at the philosophy. And people really thought they were going to create utopia forever. And I think they created a dysutopia, frankly. Is that helpful? Yes, Professor. I will include it in my reflection for today. OK. Um, anybody else? You can use examples like Shazneen used, you know. Um, there's also weather, you know, extreme weather events that are happening. Um, the United Nations has a good foundation for dealing with climate change because the UN includes climate justice that we have to change everything and be sustainable. We also have to do it in a way that doesn't just favor the rich and leave the poor with nothing. So. Thank you, Professor. Um, Professor, I had one question uh, regarding the post, like, uh, uh, Today's lessons for uh, what we will apply in our post three, right? Okay, so number one, the first class was optional. So the the ones that are required are the one on bake, bacon and lock, the one on Kant. So I'll call that number two. It was class number three and then one on utilitarianism. So I don't think you've probably done the one on Bacon. Have you done the one on Bacon and Locke? Uh, yes, uh, I submitted it. OK, good. Today. I just haven't read it yet. Good, so the next one is Kant. OK, OK. That would be due by the next class. All right, thank you, Professor. Sure, thank you. So in that video about the posts, I do say that it, it does seem confusing at first. It's not the way you're trained to do college or to do school, right? You're sort of trained to be detached and just, you know, and I want you to be engaged and I want you to have opinions, but also to link all these things together. So it's a different, it really is a different part of your mind. And I know that would be confusing. That's why I did a whole video about that. Um, and you might be frightened to do it because it's exactly often what you're told not to do in other classes is have your own opinions. Um, but I think that's how you develop examined opinions. That's how you develop good substantial opinions is that you start out having them and then you self-correct and then you expand them. And then you get into this dialogue with yourself and other people where you're, where you're constantly developing your worldview. So that's, that's what I want you to do. Anybody else? 